Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming along to this session. My name is Grant Mayer. I'm a neuroradiologist based at the University of Edinburgh and NHS Lothian. And myself and colleagues are going to talk to you today about our project, um, which has been looking at the challenges and applications of using deep learning methods on medical imaging for acute ischemic stroke. And this is part of the Modern Machine Learning Approaches for Image Analysis program. Next slide, please. Okay, so first I just wanna set the scene with the uh, clinical need. The top picture there is Wembley Stadium during a concert from the singer Adele. There's 90,000 people in the stands and 10,000 people on the pitch. That's the same number of people who have a stroke every year in the UK. Stroke is a serious condition. Many people will be familiar with it. Um, it, it usually causes a sudden onset of disability. People often have problems with movement, speech, etc. And following a stroke, we talk in terms of the one third rule, which means approximately one third of patients will recover, one third of patients will be left um, disabled, and one third of patients will sadly die. To improve that and increase the, the proportion of patients who have good outcomes, we have two treatments available to us. The image with the little jars there is the um, thrombolytic that we use, which is a drug that, that we can inject to break down the blood clot that causes ischemic stroke. So the blockage in the vessel that's denying the brain of its essential nutrients. Um, next to that, you can see a little cartoon showing um, the uh, thrombectomy, which is a process of going into the artery and actively pulling out the clot using a, a tiny device uh, through a catheter. So that's the middle image. Now to do that, to make decisions about these treatment options to try and improve the proportion of patients who get good outcomes, we most commonly, and this is true in most countries around the world, use plain CT. The image in the bottom right is a non-enhanced CT of the brain. And you can see there's some difference there between the gray and white matter and the CSF centrally within the brain. So that CT, we use that to look for lesions that would account for the stroke symptoms. However, we have to do that rapidly. We have to do it against the clock because the treatments that I've mentioned uh, require um, to be given as soon as possible and, and certainly within certain time limits. Next slide, please. So the aims of our project then was to develop a deep learning method for automating stroke lesion detection and to harness the predictive power of deep learning. Um, and today, though, I'm only going to talk about uh, assessing as acute ischemic lesions, um, although I think ultimately we will, we will branch out into other parts. Now, deep learning, as most people I think in this meeting will know, requires very large volumes of standardized data labeled or coded as to the presence or absence for the imaging feature of interest. So there are some challenges when we do this with medical imaging. The first is that data access is not universal. Medical imaging is quite correctly highly restricted for patient confidentiality reasons. And because individual hospitals and health trusts manage their own data, you tend to have these silos of imaging data. Uh, deep learning requires, as I said, labeling or an understanding of what's on the images. Um, so for that, we, would, we might require a gold standard or a ground truth. Now, when it comes to CT, because of uh, some features of ischemic stroke that I, I won't have time to go into today, it can be very difficult to understand if there is actually an ischemic stroke lesion there. And expert opinion will even vary as to whether or not there's, a, there's an abnormality. So we don't have a ground truth. The best we have is a gold standard, but it's inherently flawed. Imaging data for uh, clinical care is heterogeneous, at least in terms of computational analysis. Medical data is not standardized for that. It's standardized more so that we understand what um, is needed in terms of making clinical decisions. Um, but the, the imaging is not standardized for computational development. And next, classic deep learning methods are not known to work well in CT data. There is a lack of literature and a lack of open source code for deep learning for CT images. Most previous work using brain imaging is based on MRI. And finally, the other challenge is that deep learning has a black box kind of nature to it. And for clinical care, we really need to understand and to increase the confidence of the clinical users and the patients, what the system is doing. We're all aware of the types of examples where a system seems to be working well, but is actually uh, talking about uh, erroneous things. So um, our approach, I'm going to talk about our approaches today. I'm going to be assisted by two of my colleagues, Dr. Wen Wen Lee, who is a postdoc, has been building both a bespoke pipeline for processing brain imaging 
in preparation for then developing a novel deep learning method for detecting ischemic stroke lesions. She'll be followed by Alessandro Fontanella, one of our uh, PhD students, who's providing visualization methods to understand and to sense check the outputs of our deep learning system to try and unpick the black box. Next slide, please. So uh, this image on the left shows you where we got our data from, which is IST3, the third international stroke trial. Now, the reason we've done this is because IST3 recruited a large number of patients, over 3,000, uh, from 156 different centres in 12 countries over a decade. That means that they use lots of different CT scanners, lots of different patients. So we're getting a sense of kind of the real world here. Um, and similarly, um, there were minimal imaging acquisition standards given to the centres for IST3. So whilst they said, please send us a CT brain scan, like you can see in the middle of the image, um, at baseline when the patient arrives in hospital and, and at 24 to 48 hours, very little restriction was given otherwise. So they kind of just sent everything that they would normally do. Therefore, this is quite representative, highly heterogeneous, but quite representative of routine care. So high variability in CT hardware, dimensions of the scans, number of images per scan, the orientations of the scan. You can see some of these examples on the right and um, post-processing methods, patient position, et cetera. But this is beneficial for developing robust deep learning systems since the scan heterogeneity in IST3 is, as I would say, uh, representative of routine clinical care. And as I've said already, what we need for deep learning are large amounts of curated data where we have the same height and width of the image, the same number of slices in the image, the same image type, the same format, the same orientation. So I'm now going to hand over to Wen Wen Li, who's going to talk you through, first of all, the pipeline that we've developed to handle this imaging heterogeneity. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, to, as, uh, as Grant has mentioned, we have so many variety of the data, heterogeneous data. So I built up the, uh, the pipeline to deal with this kind of thing. So there, there are a few main steps. The main step by checking whether there is separate base and uh, uh, vault uh, scans. So uh, we use uh, that we because of this kind of when when I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I, I was struggling to hear you and I think others are too. Can you bring your microphone closer? Oh. Okay. That's better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So main step including like checking whether they were separated by base and vault, and also we needed to remove some non excel uh di dicom slices because in machine learning or data scientists with data science we use a nifty format instead of dicom, so we have to uh, convert this uh, at the end because the localizers and bone kernels it it doesn't show the uh the tissue very much so we have to remove them as well so the detailed pipeline is here if you uh if anyone is interested in some details uh, we, i'm happy to answer in the q a session so the uh, another challenge in our data is the no low signal to noise uh also as grant said in some cases the uh, ischemic stroke lesion can be really difficult to detect so it's it's quite subtle compared uh, compared to older stroke lesions, and also it has a varying size and locations. So you can see this is the ischemic lesion, uh, as uh, Grant has annotated. This is old stroke lesion. It compare you can see this is quite subtle compared to the older one, and also sometimes they can have really small lesions here. Uh, very and uh, we uh, sometimes we can have multiple uh, lesions and types in one scan. So this is a signal. As to the noise, we can uh, get lots of noise from the fix uh, fixation ring. Like this is to fix to hold patient's uh, head. So like here and a redundant background. So this is a like f small. Uh, this is a, with a big f uh, field of view. You can see lots of. Uh, background the blank it doesn't have much tissue but for this one it has a much less background and uh, also because lots of patients are old so some uh, like in their old age so they're old uh, some other like the noise like old circulation and chronic brain conditions like entropy or white matter issues will also cause the noise to, uh, to influence uh, the algorithm to detect the lesion so to to deal with this this kind of things we 
challenge we uh what uh, we did is like cropping we we crop some uh, uh redundant background also we can uh can uh we can also crop this figuration ring the artifact as well uh we did some image registration thing as well to register uh, uh our uh, template mi to ct to for the de uh, deep learning method to learn lesion distribution and also for this old stroke lesions or other chronic structure uh, or tissue based uh, noise we we are currently explore, exploring different uh, machine learning uh, or deep uh, deep learning methods to maximize the learning power and prediction ability so that's what we have so far have done for dealing with the debt challenge the next step we are uh, we're going to talk about the results what uh, uh, after data processing we at the beginning uh, at the beginning when I get the data we have uh, 10,659 scans from 2,578 patients so due to different reasons some patients uh, data has been uh, lost or they they are not in DICOM format and there you can see they are in different orientations height width uh, width and the slice number after processing uh, after processing, we have 5,868 scans from 2,351 patients in NIFT. So the left and right, so left and right and the both side lesion and also no lesion, they have the uh, the, the, the ratio of 0 0.29 and 0 0.24. So basically slightly more left lesion than the right and really rarely we have a both side lesion. Uh, relatively like half of the images we relative a little bit lower than half of the images we have no lesions there uh, on the image uh, labeled so scans only so after that we have like only excel uh, orientations uh, scans and a full brain with tissue kernels because for the deep learning method we need uh, the dimension in the same so uh, we did uh, we finally choose the dimension 500 uh, for uh, by 500 by 400 and by 11 slices to for a uh, deep learning algorithm take as the input so there are some uh, example input slices input in scans so that's and we have some limit of course we have some limitations during the processing um, because some scans are uh, for the separate the 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 vault and the base scans that we did was manually checking because it doesn't some scan it was quite uh, difficult for algorithm to process automatically and they have so many different uh, situations this would this should be uh, better handled in the future and also we during the registration we lost about four percent of the scans this is for deep learning to learn more um, to learn the distribution and the patterns different patterns of the lesions so it's not something wrong with the scan itself it's just after registration it has wrong registration upside down and for the efficiency it can vary quite a lot sometimes we get like as quick as like maybe two or three minutes sometimes it can be uh, longer depends on how how complex uh, the situation of the scan is and so far we only test on IST3 data so uh, we are uh, having a test we haven't tested on other data set so this will be the data processing um, processing uh, stage so in coming to the research uh, we have tried different uh, machine learning methods it doesn't work quite well on our uh, our, our image basically because a lot of the uh, classical deep learning method they have trained on a, a general image we call it a, like a cats dogs cars this kind of thing they have three uh, channels color channels but we what we have is a hand view unit in black and white you can see and also each slice they have different amount of tissue and a different structure of the brain so uh, the main idea of our algorithm we designed is to try to learn the lesion features from the half brain lesions with half brain for and then we use these features for from the half brain for a full brain lesion classification so in the the framework for the main steps we uh, when we take the input of the full brain and then we split it in the left and the right brain then we we uh, we pass it into a pre-trained half brain uh, lesion feature extractor network I which I will talk in detail in the next slides uh, and then after that we can get the right and the left brain features and then we can combine or concatenate them together 
to uh, two classifiers or two classifier one classifier is to classify whether this scan has lesion or not if it has a lesion which side it will have the which side this uh, the, the lesion will be the left side or right side or the both side of the brain has lesions so in terms of the the half brain uh, feature extraction uh, network which is the key part of our framework so uh, it contains two uh, two component two main comp components. One is a slice feature extractor network, and the other one is a slice integrate network. For the slice feature uh, extract network, we basically pass uh, we have seven layers. Each layer, so uh, every slice of this uh, every slice of the image half brain image will go through this framework, and then we will learn the features of the lesion. And then at the end, we will average across all the slices for the prediction whether this half brain has a lesion or not. So yeah, this is a very brief in, uh, explanation of our uh, main the main frameworks and uh, the components of these features and uh, the components of this framework. In terms of the results accuracy, we have overall on the test. Uh, uh, on the test scans, we have uh, 855, uh, 855 scans. The overall accuracy is 0 0.72 because uh, we have a baseline scan and follow-up scans. Baseline scans were required six hours after the uh, stroke onset, and the follow-up scans is 24 to 40 hours later. So we can clearly see the more the more time uh, from stroke onset, the more accurate the detection will be. So the follow-up scan, you can see the accuracy is about almost 10% higher than the baseline scans. Uh, and also we uh, we noticed the bottleneck of this proposed multitask learning method is the uh, is the half brain model because uh, because you can uh, you can see like uh, you can see from uh, every time uh, this this is for classifying from the from the half brain lesion half brain model whether it has higher accuracy of predicting whether this brain has a, uh, whether this brain have lesion or not it will higher they will have higher accuracy in classify whether it has a left or right or both side lesion if it has a low accuracy in classifying whether this brain has a lesion or not it will have a lower accuracy on classifying the side of the lesion so this is the overall accuracy as to the result accuracy in different lesion types, we also uh, uh, look at in different uh, subgroups like MCA, SEA, PCA, Lucina. These different uh, types of uh, different types of lesions. Uh, we can see like the MCA has the highest uh, uh, highest number of lesions. So basically, the distribution is really uh, long tailed. Uh, what from from and from the accuracy wise, we can see the MCA or both zone region really have like and also SEA have higher, uh, the highest uh, has the highest uh, uh, accuracy because the 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 border the border zone is MCA overlap with SEA or MCA overlap with PCA. So, so it means like the this kind of uh, commonly seen. Um, common lesion types they are have the highest they are easier relatively easier for algorithm to de detect but for those smaller or rarely to see lesions there is more difficult to detect the lesions so the accuracy is relatively quite low especially like the lacuna uh, the next uh, accuracy is about uh, uh, i look at uh, at the different conditions of uh, or influence uh, influenced by the uh, like an old lesion, uh, old stroke lesion entropy, uh, what they could uh, in influence our results, uh, our de the power of detection of the ischemic stroke. So, uh, in general, like uh, atrophy has the highest number uh, in among the patients, and then the, the white matter in, uh, uh, issues and also old stroke lesions. So, from our results, we can see. The r in in terms of the wrong predictions, so the uh, old stroke lesions and uh, some non stroke lesions, they significantly mostly negative, negatively affected our proposed deep learning methods. So, yeah, but uh, other like a uh, 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 hypertension, uh, hypertension artery or uh, hemorrhage, say this kind of like more like a sign, I think. So, uh, 
also have some uh, negative influence. It's, it's not negative influence, but mostly like old stroke lesion or the non stroke lesion has mostly ne negative influence on our results. So our proposed uh, uh, deep learning method have some uh, limitations uh, because, as I said, our algorithm, um, we tried different algorithm, but it doesn't really work well. And uh, there are lots of research there in MI, not in CT, plus n there, um, there is no open source code we can use. So we s currently we can't compare with uh, the uh, other deep learning methods work on CT. Uh, and also, we this deep learning method we require a specific data format. Like, uh, well, we need uh, the Excel full brain and uh, the dimensions we need to the specific uh, like the same the same dimension for the deep learning algorithm. So, uh, yeah, and uh, also the l training level reliability because we can we have compared our results with other. Uh, with expert on 14 patients, so we find that some of the training labels are not consistent uh, with uh, the with the other experts' in the, uh, annotations. So it's kind of be like in the in our training data there might be some problem or debatable reliability with the training levels, which will also affect the training performance. Uh, at the at the end, we can see that uh, finally will be the negative influence from the old stroke lesions because it's uh, as we can from the from the previous as we can see from the previous results, it does cause a lot of problem in the in in our detection of the ischemic lesion. I think uh, Alexandra will show more examples about the show, uh, about the visualization part, how uh, our algorithm are looking, what our algorithm are looking at. So, Alexandra, do you want to take yes. over? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ron. So, can you go to yeah the next slide? Okay. Uh, yes. So, we can start talking a bit about model interpretability. So, why it, it is important to, uh, to work on model interpretability. Uh, deep learning models are often described as black boxes. Uh, since it is difficult to interpret their outputs, and models uh, are created directly from data by an algorithm. And so, uh, even for researchers that design with neural networks, uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand how the different variables are combined in, by the network in order to make a prediction. And so for this reason, interpretability has a very important role. Um, and by explaining the decisions of a certain neural network, we, we, we are able to provide support to, to humans and we are also able to discover any bias that uh, may affect our model. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so there are, there are several, several reasons for which uh, neural networks can sometimes fail. And so for this reason, interpretability is important to catch these errors. Uh, so some of the reasons are, for example, if at test time, a model is presented uh, an image that is completely unrelated uh, to the images on which it was trained, uh, as is shown here, for example, uh, the case of a natural image, the image of a dog when the model was trained on CT scans of the brain. Or again, uh, also it, it could be, for example, uh, for the case of the images that were incorrectly acquired, or in our particular application, it could be bone kernels or localizer scans. Uh, other reasons may be a correlation between different variables in the data. Uh, for example, correlation between the equipment and technicians or uh, demographics and disease, or also the correlation uh, between uh, the different pathologies. Uh, so next slide, please. So the, the approach that uh, we chose to follow in order to, um, to work on interpretability was to generate uh, counterfactual explanations. So how, how do counterfactual explanation work? Uh, basically given a certain input image for which uh, our, we know that a neural network predicts a certain class, uh, a counterfactual explanation 
identifies how the image should be changed uh, for the output class to change. Uh, so in this way, we, we are able to understand which parts of the image are the most important uh, for the classification outcome and understand how they need to, to be changed in order to obtain a different class. Uh, for example, here in the figure uh, is shown a scan that has a probability of lesion of uh, 99%. And then we, we want to uh, slightly modify this, uh, this image in order to gradually uh, decrease the probability of lesion as is shown here. So the changes uh, are pretty subtle. So probably uh, it's not easy to see them uh, as an, with a naked eye. So uh, for this reason, we can, um, to make the visualization easier, we can uh, consider the difference between the original image and the counterfactual image and visualize then these pixels that change uh, with a color map uh, as is shown uh, in the saliency map uh, below. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, so in particular, the, the method that we applied in order to generate this counterfactual method uh, is uh, well, basically we propose some improvements over this latency method proposed by Cohen et al. So we, we first present this latency method and then we can discuss uh, what modifications we, we have done for our particular application. So in, in this approach, uh, we have an autoencoder and a classifier uh, that are trained separately. Uh, the autoencoder to reconstruct uh, the images and the classifier for a certain classification task of interest, for example, the lesion location uh, from CT scans. Uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, gradually perturb the input images so that the classifier uh, increases or reduces uh, the probability of its prediction. Uh, in particular, uh, we start with the autoencoder. So the encoder part takes the input image and encodes into a latent representation, a latent space Z. Uh, then we apply the decoder uh, to the latent representation in order to reconstruct the image. After that, uh, the image uh, can be fed to the classifier. And then we can compute the derivative uh, from the output of the classifier with respect to the latent space uh, of the image. Uh, finally, we can subtract the gradient that we obtain from the original latent space. And in this, in this way, we are able to move into latent space. And after uh, reconstructing again, uh, the image with the decoder, uh, the perturbed image, we obtain the counterfactual example with a different probability of lesion. Uh, in particular, if we move in the, a negative direction, we decrease the probability. And if we move in the positive direction, we uh, increase the probability. So if we uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, so here is shown our approach. Uh, what we do is we basically minimize uh, the equation that is shown here. So there are two terms, basically. Uh, the first term is the L1 uh, norm between the latent space of the original image and the latent space of the uh, counterfactual image, the reconstructed image. So we want to minimize this distance uh, because we think that it's important to that the generated image is as close as possible to the original image uh, so that the changes that we observe uh, can be attributed uh, really to the class shift and not to just random noise. So this is the first modification. Uh, the second modification is that we, uh, in the second term, where we consider a cross entropy loss between the output of the classifier on us on the reconstructed image and a certain target class. Uh, so in this way, we are able to choose a specific target class for the counterfactual image. While in the previous approach, we would only be able to decrease or increase the probability of a certain class. Uh, so this is better because uh, for example, let's consider the case of a scan with a lesion in uh, the left half. So uh, we have uh, 
the classification outcome is lesion on the left. With the latent shift approach, we can only decrease the probability of that class, but we don't know how the other classes are modified. For example, uh, we decrease the probability of lesion on the left, but maybe uh, it will increase the probability of lesion on the right, which is undesirable. Uh, so in our approach, on the other hand, we can choose, for example, as target, no lesion. So we are sure that uh, the lesion will be uh, removed from the left, but we will not be, the other classes will not be influenced in undesirable ways. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide. Uh, here we have some, some examples of CLNC maps uh, that were created with the different approaches. So in order to obtain these CLNC maps, uh, we consider, we first generate the counterfactual examples in the way that we have uh, discussed. And then we can consider the difference between the original image and the counterfactual image and then visualize the pixels that change the most. Uh, usually we tend to visualize the pixel in the 99th percentile. Um, so in particular, in, in this figure is shown um, a scan with a very clear lesion in the left MCA region of the brain. And we have the saliency maps generated with the two difference approaches. So um, I think maybe it's not so easy to see from the slide, but I think that uh, with both approaches, um, both approaches tend to kind of highlight the correct region of the brain, even if uh, our approach may be a bit more precisely. So for this reason, we also did a quantitative analysis of, uh, of the saliency maps. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so here are the results of our quantitative evaluation. So we want to uh, evaluate how well the different approaches are able to highlight the areas that are uh, related to the stroke region. So uh, in order to do this, we consider a test set of around 400 scans uh, for which we know the lesion location. In particular, the lesion location is one of six classes, uh, which are ACA, PCA, MCA, left or right. Um, and this, of, of course, these, uh, these scans are test scans that uh, were, not, were not shown to the model during the training, so are new examples. And to get the saliency maps, we, as I mentioned, we compute the difference between the original image and the counterfactual image. And in order to evaluate the obtained saliency map, we consider this score, uh, so the ratio between hits divided by hits plus misses. And in particular, a hit is counted uh, if the pixel with the greatest change is in the correct region out of the six regions, and a miss is counted otherwise. So we can observe uh, two things. Uh, the first thing is that with um, by using the multitask model and our approach to generate the counterfactual, we get the highest score of around 62.5%. And with the same model, but the latent shift method to generate counterfactual, we get a score of around 52%. Uh, the second thing that we can notice is that by using the uh, multitask model described previously by Wen Wen, we get uh, scores that are much higher than if we use a, a model with a similar architecture, but trained uh, only on a single task on uh, full brains and to end on full brains. Uh, and yeah, if we can move on to, to the next slide now. So uh, yeah, now we can, we can discuss some limitations of our, our approach. So um, in, the, in the slide with the example of saliency map, maps, we are shown uh, an example of a scan with a very clear lesion. And so for this kind of scans, uh, the saliency maps usually tend to highlight well the relevant areas of the brain. Uh, but there are some cases where the lesion is not as clear. For example, the case of the scan uh, that is shown in the, in, the, in the picture here, where uh, it has a scan in the right MCA region, but is for sure more subtle and difficult to, to see. So for these kinds of region, 
Uh, sometimes the, the saliency maps tend to be a bit more scattered around. Uh, maybe assign that the model is less certain about the lesion location, even if it usually kind of still highlight uh, the correct region. Um, another issue, another limitation is that um, some parts of the image uh, that are not in the area of the lesion are sometimes still highlighted by the visualization method. Uh, so one thing to consider is that uh, probably the model has to consider all the different parts of the image in order to make its prediction. So maybe this uh, issue cannot be completely fixed by uh, any visualization method, uh, but we think that maybe in future work, we are considered uh, the possibility to train an autoencoder that takes as input uh, the attribution map uh, created by our method and output the sentence map uh, restricted only to the relevant area. Yeah, so um, so thank you both Wenwen and Alessandro for um, that summary. Just some conclusions. We've tried to take uh, on a, what is really a whistle-stop tour of, of um, really several years of work. And so yes, we've tried to squeeze in quite a lot into 45 minutes, but our, our main kind of conclusions are really that, that you know, CT is the commonly used modality for imaging patients with stroke in clinical practice. Um, but there is limited deep learning research and open source code. So we've kind of had to start at the beginning. Uh, real world data are best for developing deep learning, um, but we found that the image quality and labeling of real world data is heterogeneous and, and it's not widely available for research. So what our data processing pipeline has tried to do is reduce some of that variability um, for several CT imaging features that we commonly find and none of this is covered in previous literature. Um, our novel then DL method or deep learning method that we've developed is starting to show some potential for ischemic, uh, ischemic stroke lesion detection. We haven't touched on it today, but we are also or vaguely touched on it today. We're also looking to develop it to detect all uh, features relevant for these patients. And finally, saliency maps show that the model is usually able to identify the correct lesion location and there's le less certainty with subtle lesions, which is interesting because that's kind of how humans behave. I should say that we are in the process of um, writing up two, two papers on this work, one for the pipeline and one for the deep learning method. We just go to the final slide, please. William. So of course, uh, projects like this, it was not just the three of us, there's a much larger group of people involved. So just like to acknowledge and thank them for their inputs. And also to thank HDR UK for, as a principal funder of this project, but also the, the College of Radiologists for, for um, pump priming a smaller project that got this going. So thank you very much for your attention. And we've finished a few minutes early, so there'll be more time for questions. Um, and I see that some have already come through on the chat. That, that's great, thanks. Thanks, Grant. And uh, it's Dave Robertson here. And thanks, Grant and Wen Wen and, uh, uh, and uh, Alessandra for, for, for the talk. Um, I, I think yes, as Grant says, there's we've got questions in the in the chat already. So I'll maybe do them first, and then open up if there are any other ones. Um, and I'll maybe get you to ask them actually. Just shout shout them out. I'll, Hong Han was I think the first one up with a question in the chat. Hong Han, do you want to ask it in person? Would that be a maybe the best because it's quite a long question? Sure. <clears throat> Great talk again. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and uh, very interesting research. Um, yeah, my question actually relates to Wen Wen's point, uh, saying that uh, pre-trained models on um, other images like ImageNet might not perform very well on these particular um, you know, clinical images like uh, stroke scans. So I think I, I attended a workshop um, o o organized by Tune Institute um, about two weeks ago, and there's there was a talk about, it's just briefly mentioned a Stanford group have done this comparison between internet pre-training, transfer learning, uh, compared to multimodal data, you know, uh, stress reports associated with uh, images, uh, clinical images, and also image itself uh, for, for transfer learning, kind of self-supervised learning by using uh, information from free text to guide the um, imaging processing and deep neural network um, models. They proved or they showed the latter approach performed well or uh, better, or even much better. So I just wondered whether that be an area um, for the next phase of your project, consider this approach. Uh, I mentioned this because I mentioned uh, our group, you know, 
and Will Whiteley, B. Alex, and uh, myself uh, leading a clinical NLP group uh, in Edinburgh. So we are, we're interested in this approach and uh, we're we are talking to people with uh, this kind of data for some eye diseases. And for, for brain images, it could be a potential um, collaboration if you, you, you're interested in this. Uh, that's my question or comment, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Indeed, there is lots of potential like transfer learning or uh, we, uh, mm, we in the at a certain stage, we did try to, you know, you know, either using the, you know, the, the ways or uh, learn from different uh, res uh, like ImageNet or their ways. And also we try to use the component like a skip, a, uh, like a skip connection or uh, relational modules, things like that. So we try to integrate at a different levels, but Mm, it doesn't really improve much, but uh, yeah, as you said, you pointed a very uh, like a good way of doing collaboration. Maybe we, maybe maybe we didn't find it the the better way of doing that. That would be a good, uh, good a good opportunity for us to explore in the in the next stage. I think. Great. So yeah. Great. Okay. So next question is from um, from you and Hemingway. You and do you want to ask it? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so thanks again. Very nice talk. And yeah, I really enjoyed the, the breakdown about uh, how the performance happened on different areas and different subsets. Um, I was thinking about um, the effect of lesion size and particularly with the architectural choice to integrate or sort of average the per slice predictions. And it seems like that might have an effect where if you have very small lesions that only are on one slice versus um, a much larger legion across a number of slices that that mean could probably uh, might destroy this, this or make that signal less obvious for the small lesion. So I was wondering if there's any analysis or comment about lesion size and the architectural choices. Uh, yes, indeed. We we actually indeed look at. Well, I didn't put it in this slide, but uh, we did indeed look at the infra size uh, uh, associated with the the accuracy. Uh, basically, as you can imagine, the smaller the size, the lower the accuracy would be. Uh, another thing in your in your question, you also mentioned about uh, because the average across the slices, may, you know, later maybe the small um, it will have the impact uh, uh, effect on the, the the final prediction because some some si some. Uh, uh, in fact, it could be quite small. It indeed happened. I look at some in a like a lacuna or uh, some small size. The accuracy is really, really quite is quite low, actually. So uh, you you are very accurate about that. That's the, another thing we uh, wanted to to address. As you can see, like the lacuna or other like a small size of some lesions, like. They are not really commonly seen in the patients, so we do not have lots of training sample, samples. So I guess it will be difficult for any kind of uh, uh, machine learning uh, architecture, especially you want to, you know, the MC or the big size lesion are mostly common. You want to accommodate this kind of two extreme situations in one, in one architecture might be challenging. Right. Mm. Uh, Thank you. Next, ne next one up, I think, is is Will. Will Whiteley, do you want to ask your question? Thanks, Grant and team. Uh, I just wanted to ask that there, there are a couple. As Grant knows, there are a couple of companies active in this space. Um, Brainomics being the one that springs to mind, and Rapid. And um, I just wondered if you could uh, outline for me and the, everyone else the difference between their approaches and your approach, and why you think they work differently. Yeah, so I think just I'll maybe start with this and I kind of from a more clinical perspective, then, um, you know, our, the main difference, I think, is in, in our approach is that we try to capture the whole brain um, from the from the outset. So, um, again, other people may, may not be familiar with the other software, but much of the other software really just targets the most common area, which is the MCA. And if you remember, there was about 90 percent of our lesions were in the MCA territory. We try to target the whole brain. And, and look at lesions uh, no matter where they fall. So that would be the main difference because of course people come in and have stroke lesions in, in all sorts of different places, not just in the, in the MC territory. Um, I, I think another difference is that we're using deep learning for development. I think that the um, commercial entities tended to have um, used kind of inverted commas simpler uh, machine learning methods. Now someone can correct me if that's not the correct terminology, but um, 
I, do, I don't, I believe they've not used deep learning for the development. And I think the final thing probably would be that we're developing open source uh, products here and, and not necessarily with a view to commercializing them, um, which is, a, a, again, a, a big difference uh, to the other companies. You know, I think, Will, you'd mentioned is there a, uh, ability to kind of compare them. I think we're at the point where we've really just started to get results from the data set that we had available. Um, I think the next step is going to be testing it on other data sets and against other things, for example, other software that might be doing similar things. So these are kind of next steps that we haven't quite got to yet. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Bea, uh, Bea Alex is um, next up, I think. Hi, uh, my question is just about whether um, there is any inter CUDA agreement on the gold standard available and also whether there are, I asked this grant directly, but but whether there are any reports um, along with the um, IST3 data. Yeah, so so you know, we mentioned that where the data had come from, and it was kind of all over the world and we were sent the scans, but what we weren't sent were the local reports for the scans in all of the cases. I think there were some. Um, but, but ISD3 was run on the idea that experts would look at the scan centrally, masked to all the other information using a kind of bespoke platform for doing that, which means that the scans are coded rather than having a, a, a blurb of free text to work with. And um, so that's kind of what we have. There is some free text in there, so, so experts were able to make comments about what they found and what they didn't find, et cetera. But for the most part, it's straightforward coding which is kind of already in a, a nice format for this work. So it doesn't require an NLP layer necessarily. Um, and then you've also asked about the intercoder agreement. So we had 10 experts working and there was some overlap between them in terms of the cases that were looked at. And also we, we did a sort of sub-study um, and got them all to read a small sample of the, exactly the same scans and compare the results. And we've previously published on that. And, the results for that, uh, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning, are imperfect. You know, as, as these things, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. And even if you take those 10 experts and ask them to, and, uh, you know, my colleagues today have shown some examples that are quite subtle. And, you know, you can imagine that people don't always agree whether or not there is, in fact, a finding there. Um, and as when has mentioned, that is a limitation of this method. We've trained something using a gold standard that's imperfect. Um, so, you know, it can never be perfect in its, in its outputs based on that. So, again, next steps will be to think about how we might, um, you know, develop this using kind of perhaps more robust um, uh, methods, but, but they, they don't exist. They, they don't have a ground truth for this. So, so it's, a, it's a challenge, but um, not an easy one to solve, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Arlene, Katie, I think, um, has a question. Yes, thanks. So I was just wondering what your definition of follow-up was, if it was within the same definition, and yeah, it as it improved the results, I was wondering if you could, you know, if they'd been a patient over several years, if you combined that all, would it actually improve your results more? So possibly. So the, so the, each of the patients had a scan uh, baseline, which means within six hours of the onset of their ischemic stroke. And they also had a, a scan at follow up. And for, for that, us, that means between 24 and 40 hours at the same admission within hospital. So just a kind of day or two days after they came into hospital and things have started maybe to settle a little. Now, clearly, if some of the patients died and didn't get those second scans because they, they were unable to go for them, um, and other patients had other scans as they needed for clinical needs. We've got others that are peppered at slightly different times, both earlier and later. But most of the patients, it's within six hours for baseline and at 24 to 48 hours for follow-up. Now, um, the reason that the system gets better, and again, some of the examples that were shown today, is that if you scan a patient at baseline and you scan them at 10 hours and you scan them at 24 and you scan them at 100 hours, that lesion gets more and more and more obvious to both the humans and it would seem to our deep learning method which is why the system, I think, um, uh, performs better. I also think that's quite nice, a bit like um, the, the work that Alessandra is doing. It shows that the system is picking up the real signal. If it's getting better with a more obvious signal, that kind of fits, um, and it's not kind of doing something daft. Um, it's got nothing to do with the region. Thanks. Can I just ask, so, so when somebody gets more and more scans like that and the lesion becomes more prominent, if you like, you're also getting a radiology report with that that's that's sort of giving that same information is it yeah so that so the expert coding it comes along with all of these scans and 
you know, in, in exactly the same way, um, the experts are more likely to agree and to be correct about what they're seeing when, this, when the lesions are more obvious. So, so as time goes on, in fact, our gold standard probably gets more accurate for the later scans than it is for the early scans. Thanks. Great. So um, does anybody have any other questions? Uh, if you do, there's two things you can do. One is type, type something in the chat and I'll see it. Or you can just shout if that's what you want to do. Any, any, anybody else? Have Martin any... Dennis here. Hi, Martin. Hi. Um, a couple of questions, really. Um, one, um, Grant, you alluded to maybe different approaches: deep learning versus machine learning. Um, the systems that are out there commercially have had to undergo regulatory approvals, uh, and I think that probably limits to some extent the approaches that can be taken certainly the brainomics and things aren't able to have a continuously learning system which you're using the most up-to-date they have to release it in in six monthly or yearly batches so that they can have a regulatory approval of each in case it performance changes do you think that's going to be an issue about using things like deep learning I don't think it, thank you, Martin, for that question. I don't think it should matter how the system is trained, actually. I think the because of the way that the the the, the, cl the clinical uh, allowance, the CE marking that we currently have that says you can use this in clinical practice, the way that works is really just for the company to present data that shows much as we've done today that this is how accurate our system is. Um, and that data doesn't necessarily even need to be peer reviewed. Sadly, it's quite it's quite stri striking actually that they can they can present their own data from in house effectively and say this is how well it performs. And the the assessors for the CE marking, which is in the UK is the MHRA, will say, well that's fine, that's in it. And often they'll say it's as good as this other system that does it. Um, and you know I would argue that we're possibly not quite there, but we're we're heading towards that. So. I would suspect that we could get um, uh, approval for use based on a deep learning method, but you're quite right. You can't um, fully, what we'd really want is a system that gets smarter with all the data that's sent to it and continually learns, but that's not possible under the current legislative network. And, and I think that is, I've talked about this separately before, but that's a major problem with the setup because really we would like these systems to, to get better. Um, and in fact, Martin, what I've, I've heard anecdotally is that companies avoid uh, making too big changes to their software because they don't want to go under the scrutiny of the assessors again and so they'll keep things kind of simple so again we're kind of being hamstrung here in terms of what's potentially possible with these systems and can I, my, my second question was really and I, it may be i just didn't understand what was being said at some points um where you have a series of scans first second third fourth is the deep learning going back to the first, having us having identified what is visible on the second or third, because one would hope eventually that the that the the automated algorithm might be better than any clinical eye in detecting the very early changes. And you know, one could also think about whether having an MRI telling you exactly what was going on early could inform the the deep learning interpretation of the acute CT. You're quite right. We haven't done that. We've separated out the scans as sort of independent entities, if you like. So from the same patient, if there's two or three scans, they're all they were all trained as uh, two or three different scans, and we would we didn't kind of tell the system that they were related. Of course, that is a way. You're quite right that, that the system could learn to say, look, this scan here is going to does have a lesion on that very early time point, even though we can't see it because we know because we can see it on the follow up scan. And, and as you say, with other modalities such as MRI, you get the same information. We haven't been able to do that in IST3 with MRI because there are very few. But again, these are ways that we hope to improve the system with time. Um, you know, the ideas of kind of transfer learning and, and taking learning from other data types to try and inform what you've done. Um, so, yes, I think we, we hope to do those kind of things. Yeah, I'm certainly aware that with the AI systems out there at the moment, experts looking at the output to sometimes uh, have their awareness of an acute lesion raised by the system. I, the system is detecting things they weren't identifying uh, on, a, on a blinded assessment. Yeah. yeah. 
I think, I've, again, from my experience, some of these systems have been developed to be highly sensitive, but less specific. So to, to do exactly that. So they're more likely to call something that perhaps isn't real, but they're also more likely to call something that's subtle and is real. And it's our job as the human interpreter to then say, okay, I do or don't agree with that. But it, if it points you in the right direction, that does make it easier. Good. Um, any more questions? Um, going, going, gone. And the timing is, al is almost perfect. Thanks very much uh, to the team giving the talk and thanks very much for turning up uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.